Hey church, happy Easter to you. I hope you're really enjoying your Easter long weekend. I know for Donna and I, we absolutely love this weekend being Easter weekend, don't we Donna? Yes, we certainly do. Easter is definitely one of my favourite times of year. Weather-wise, I feel like it's perfect, those cool evenings and mornings. Um, But also, yeah, of course, it's one of the great um, dates on our Christian calendar. So yeah, I absolutely love Easter. Yeah, I agree. I I believe the church actually comes alive this weekend. I love that we get to honour our Lord on this weekend. And then today we get to celebrate our risen King, our risen Saviour. So what a great service we have today. So grab your uh, wine, grab your, uh, your bread and prepare for communion because we're going to have a really special communion together today. Okay, well, before we go any further, let's pray together. You know, church, there'll there'll be an opportunity for you to put your prayer requests there on the line. You'll see it on the screen. But know that our team do pray over your requests and and commit you to God. So we want to do that now. And uh, so let's do that together. Mm -hmm. Our Heavenly Father, we're just so grateful to arrive here today on Resurrection Sunday. And we're we're here again in your presence So we commit our service to you and and I pray that each person, wherever they are this morning, will have a sense um, of your life within them, of your encouragement around them and your love in their hearts, Lord God. And I pray for anyone who has a deep need at the moment, that they will know they can cry out to you and you are well able to meet their needs because of Jesus. We thank you. Amen. Amen. So here we are on Resurrection Sunday and I have the privilege this morning of leading you in communion so I just invite you to prepare for that be ready and um, yeah and let's wherever you are in your home let's do this together you know in John eleven twenty five, 25 Jesus said these words I am the resurrection and the life he who believes in me will live even though he dies and whoever lives and believes in me will never die You know, in saying these words, Jesus would have been well aware of what it would need to actually make those words a reality. It would mean that he would need to give up his life for us. And yet, knowing that, he never relinquished at all. He was resolute in going to the cross. And even on that last Passover, he said to his disciples, I've so longed with passion and desire to eat this Passover with you before I endure my suffering. And we know how the story goes. He went on to give his life. And he instituted for us this wonderful way of remembering that cost and that price. And so... Let me just uh, read for you if you get your bread ready. He said, He lifted up the loaf and after praying a prayer of thanksgiving to God, he gave each of his apostles a piece of bread saying, This loaf is my body, which is now being offered to you. Always eat it and remember me. So I just invite you now to take a moment and take your bread. Then after supper was over, he lifted up the cup again and said, This cup is my blood of the new covenant I make with you, and it will be poured out soon for all of you. And so now I just invite you to take your cup as you remember that. And let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're so grateful. We're so grateful for the plan that you had to redeem us. So grateful that when you knew it would cost the life of your son, Jesus, you were willing to go ahead with that plan and so was he. And so we thank you, Jesus, for giving up your life for us. We thank you that it cost you your life. We thank you for your blood that was shed for us. But we in turn are so grateful for the resurrected life that we now get to share in because of you. And so we thank you again this morning on Resurrection Sunday. In Jesus' precious name, amen. 
my heart's response is to worship Jesus in this moment. I'd like to invite you to do the same. Grace, what have you done? Murdered for me on the cross. Accused in absence of my sin washed away in your blood. Too much to make sense of it all. I know that your love broke my fall. The scandal of grace, you died in my place. Score some Easter eggs this morning? No. <laughs> Perhaps that's a good 10 a.m. question. Well, what I want to ask you is this. What is the biggest disappointment you had as a kid? I know I don't want to take you. I'm triggering some of you. What is the, one of the biggest letdowns you had as a kid? Do you know what mine was? That I never got voted to be a prefect. I know, a lot of you are surprised. I'm good prefect material. I've got to tell you, I wasn't good prefect material. Um, I've only just kind of getting through that. But as kids and as adults, we go through disappointment, not getting something we hope for. And somebody, and the title of today's message is Holding On to Hope. Somebody once said, unbelievable as it, is, as it may seem, it is possible for a person to live up to 70 days without food, to exist for nearly 10 days without water, and you can live up to six minutes without air. But there is one thing it is impossible to live without, hope. Hope is like oxygen to the soul. Without it, we might live physically, but we'll be dead on the inside. There's a great Charlie Brown cartoon. Who remembers Charlie Brown? Saturday morning, TV time, Lucy and Linus sitting in front of the television set when she says to Linus, go get me a glass of water. Linus looks surprised. Why should I do anything for you? 
He said, you never do anything for me. On your 75th birthday, Lucy promised, I'm going to bake you a cake. <laughs> Linus gets up and heads for the kitchen, saying to himself, life is more pleasant when you have something to look forward to. <laughs> Let me ask you another question. Where is your hope? Is it in cake? Sometimes in my life, don't judge me, my hope has been in cake. <laughs> the problem is that when cake is gone, what then? Is our hope, and is your hope in something you can lose? So what is your hope in? And is it in something you can lose? Most of us have a list when we get older of things we had our hope in until they let us down. I had my, always had my hope in looking young. When I was a teenager, I complained to my mum one day that I was looking ugly. You know, when you're a teenager, you think you look really ugly. And I remember my mum's famous words, don't worry, Roz, when you're in your 30s and everyone's losing their looks, you won't have to, any, you won't have to worry. You won't have any to lose. <laughs> she, she was trying to help me. So that one didn't work. Career, family, house, future plans, all good things. But they can be lost. 1 Peter 1 says this 3, 5. Let us thank the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It was through his loving kindness that we were born again into a new life and have a hope that never dies. A living hope. This hope is ours because Jesus was raised from the dead. We will receive great things that we have been promised. They are being kept safe in heaven for us. They are pure and will not pass away. Listen to this. They will never be lost. Peter is telling us that because Christ rose from the dead, hope in him will never be lost. If we put hope in him, it will last forever. It is a living hope. And I want to look at three areas today. I want to look at cultural hope. Hope in Christ and personal hope. Are you ready? Cultural hope. What hope can we take from the current culture? Well, let's just think of last year. Last year, the world lost a lot of hope. It was a dark time. However, they say that even before COVID-19, something was happening in our Western world, in our culture. It has been experiencing a growing crisis of hope. They say Generation Z, which I found out are the Zoomers, kind of copying off us, we're the boomers, um, mid-1990s to 2010, that's the Zoomers, are far more pessimistic about the future and about themselves than all the generations that have gone before. They suffer boredom, chronic indifference, and have lost a sense of meaning. Today, there is a loss of social trust in all the institutions that have held society together. There is more discontent, depression, drug abuse, despair, addiction, and loneliness in Western societies than there has ever been. We are more polarized, fragmented. We have lost cohesion and meaning. Aren't you glad you came to Easter Sunday? In the last 10 years, listen to this, we have seen an increase in suicide Suicide is the ultimate loss of hope. People take their life because they can't live. They've lost hope. Every eight days, every eight, every day, eight Aussies take their lives. It is the number one cause of death in the ages 15 to 44. We thought technology might solve mental health. Has technology solved mental health? Has it solved issues around race? Sexual abuse, domestic violence, bullying, genocide. When I was training to be a teacher, it was about 100 years ago in the late 70s, they taught us this. They taught us that when, because that century, last century, the 20th century, we had come through two world wars, the Depression, and as human beings, we were now on the progress, we were now on a track to enlightenment and progress. They told us that we were leaving e evil behind and human beings were perfected. 
being perfected. I was 18. So guess what, Annette? I believed them. I thought, great, I've been born in such a great century. I missed the wars. I missed the depression. However, over the next decade, that philosophy unraveled for me because I began to read. I read about Mao Zedong. Between the years of 1943 and 76, he murdered, they say, 15 to 55 million people. I couldn't see any enlightenment there. Pol Pot killed 1.5 million in late 70s. North Korea, 1.6 million. Ethiopia, 1.5 were killed in between 75 and 78. Rwanda in 1994, 800,000. Where was the enlightenment? Steve Pinker wrote a book called The Brief History of Tomorrow in 2017. This is what he says. We no longer need God. Humanity now is God. We are our own hope for the future. We are our own God. We can have not just hope but confidence in a bright future because we have all the resources within ourselves to bring it about. I'm not sure where Stephen Pinker lives. He obviously doesn't live in any of these five nations. If you Google current genocide, these are the nations that will come up. Syria, Sudan, Myanmar, Central Africa, Yemen. Not to mention the Uyghur Muslims in China. And then there is human trafficking, which is the number one trade in our world. There are more slaves today than there were in Wilbur Wilberforce's time. Believing humans can bring about a utopia by our own efforts, which is a happy life, a perfect life for everyone, will only lead to disappointment. There's only one person that will promise that, and that will be the Antichrist, and you've got to remember that. (laughs) Science, government, and technology have not been able to eradicate evil. They can't change the human heart. But there is hope. Because there is a God who has promised to guide history to a new beginning. In fact, he said this, that this world is passing away. If you don't want to be disappointed in life, you have to remember that this world had a start and it's going to have a finish. It is passing away. But Jesus said that there would be a new earth and a new heaven where there is no more suffering or sadness. How do we know this? Because Christ himself suffered at the hand of humans and then he rose from the dead. And then he sent his Holy Spirit into our hearts so our hearts could be changed and transformed. And that is the only hope we have and that is the hope for the world. Jesus Christ is the hope for the world because Jesus Christ is the only one that can change a human heart. He sent a memo to us, remember, in John 14. Gone to the Father's house to prepare a place for you. We'll be back soon to pick you up. (laughs) Second point, hope in Christ. The biblical word for hope is elpida which means profound certainty. Christians have a profound certainty that because Christ was the first to rise from the dead, we will also be resurrected. If he hadn't risen from the dead, would you rise from the dead? Would you have the confidence that you were going to rise from the dead? 1 Peter 1.21 says this, Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, so your faith and hope are in God. Tim Keller says this, the resurrection is not a stupendous magic trick, but an invasion. The cross and the resurrection together and only together bring the future new creation. The omnipotent power through which God renews and heals the entire world, he brings it into our present The first step is to believe that the resurrection of Jesus Christ really happened. And if you have doubts about that, Google, read books. You need to believe that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a historical fact. Christianity isn't just suspicion. It's all based on historical fact. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul writes, he says, 
the tw- Christ was seen by the 12. Then 500 eyewitnesses, most of who are still living. And then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. Paul is saying, if you don't believe me, go and ask the guys that are still alive. 500 eyewitnesses, account after account after account. And then he says, if you still don't believe, go and find the body. You won't find the body. They couldn't find the body. Because exactly what I said, Jesus Christ rose in bodily form. He had a transformed body. That's why they didn't recognize him. But he wasn't a ghost. A ghost still has a body. And the last proof is that um, evidence of the resurrected Christ was the birthing of the church. Why would hundreds give their lives for the birthing of a new church if the guy was still dead, an ordinary bloke just lying in a grave? But they gave their lives because Christ was alive. How can you explain that over 2,000 years still here we are worshipping and we sense his presence in our midst? How would we all make it up? And we wouldn't follow a liar. Jesus promised he rose from the dead. He would rise from the dead. They gave their lives. They wouldn't give their lives for a dead liar. I just want to say one other thing about the reason for hope in Christ. Romans 4.25 says this. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. What does that mean? The definition of justification is this. It's a legal term derived from the verb to make someone righteous. It is a term that has legal connotation. It envisions a courtroom, a heavenly courtroom with God as the judge. The scripture does say that God is the judge. And we are standing in front of him. We are the accused. And the Bible says we have all sinned. So we stand there as sinners. And the Bible also says that the wages of sin is death. The issue for God is he's not just a judge, he's a father. So he wants all his sons and daughters to be with him. He says, so he started a divine plan. He came up with a divine plan. And you know, I always have this picture of me standing in the courtroom And I know I've sinned. You know you've sinned. And and the father says, the wages of sin is death, Ros. Your life will pay for your sin. So just about when I'm about to hand him over the check, Jesus Christ is also in the courtroom. And he takes the check out of my hand. And he gives me his check of death, paid in full. He said, give that to the father. And then the Bible says this, that not only did he Forgive me, but he also made us his righteousness. 1 Corinthians 5 says this, For God made the only one who did not know sin to become sin for us. You've got to ponder on that scripture. What is the sin that breaks your heart? He became that. He became sin. And then it says this, So that we might become the righteousness of God through our union with him. So then he gives us another check. It's a deposit. And he said, I give you my righteousness. Do you know what righteousness is? Righteousness is as though you had never sinned. The scripture, God declares your position completely righteous. Because you cannot be righteous on your own. You might get three out of ten. Jen Durheim might get five out of ten. She's a bit more better than me. Maria might get six. But I don't think any of you are going to get above six. Guess what you need? You need ten out of ten. And Christ had ten out of ten. And he declares you righteous, completely justified. And that is your answer when the enemy comes with the number one lie to you. You've never been good enough. You aren't good enough, and you never will be good enough. Christ is there, and he says, she is righteous. God declares her righteous. You know, I don't know what you're like with your cup of tea. Mark says a funny cup of tea person. We have hot water, puts the tea bag in, and then takes it straight out. So it's, why don't you just have hot water? I'm not like that. When, we, when I have a cup of tea, I put the tea bag in and I just leave it there. 
And this is, I just want to give you this illustration of you being in Christ. So wherever this cup goes, the tea bag goes. The Bible says that you are in Christ. When you're a new creation, you came into Christ. So that's why the scripture says this amazing thing. He says, you have been called. You have been justified. You have been sanctified. You have been glorified. You have been seated in heavenly places with Christ. You go, Roz, why? Because you're in Christ. And wherever he goes, you go. You were buried with him. You were raised with him. You will be resurrected with him. You are in Christ. And when the Father sees you, he sees you completely in Christ. That should give you great confidence. You are not in sin. You are not in shame. You are not in guilt. You are in Christ. For the sin of 2022, for the sin of 2025, however long you live. Why? Because it's a great and glorious salvation. It's not half. The problem of sin is solved. And last thing I want to say is this personal hope. And I want to read you a story about Aaron Ralston. This is a great story. I read this book many years ago. This guy was hiking in America. There was a big sound. He put his hand on the wall, the cliff wall. The boulder fell and landed on his hand. So the book is called Between a Rock and a Hard Place. He was there, I think, for about seven days. No one came. He was in a remote place. And in the end, if you're squeamish, put your fingers in your ear, he used a pen knife to cut off his arm and he survived, obviously, or he wouldn't have written the book. <laughs> but this is towards the end of his time. So you've got to imagine dehydration, arms going weird colours, um, so he, wrote, he writes his epitaph, carves it into the rock with his other hand. I finished the epitaph by carving RIP above my name in the birth month. Then I lean back in my harness and set the knife on top of the stone before I slip off into a trance. Colour bursts into my mind. And then I walk through the canyon wall, stepping into a living room. A blonde three-year-old boy in a red polo shirt comes running across a sunlit hardwood floor in what I somehow know is my future home. By the same intuitive perception, I know this boy is my own. I bend to scoop him into my left arm, using my handless right arm to balance him, and we laugh together as I swing him up to my shoulder. I'm mobile and free. The boy happily perches on my right shoulder, holding my arms in his little hands while I steady him with my left and right stump. Then with the shock, the vision blinks out. I'm back in the canyon. Canyon Echoes of his joyful sounds resonating in my mind, creating a subconscious reassurance that somehow I will survive this entrapment. Despite having already come to accept that I will die where I stand before help arrives, now I believe I will live. That belief, that boy, changes everything for me. I love that story. Because it's like us. When Christ came, he gave us the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says the Holy Spirit's an inheritance of what is to come. And that's what Aaron Rolston needed on that lonely path. He needed a glimpse of the future to keep him going. And you and I, so many times in our lives, we need the glimpse of the future, the reminder of what is to come. And that Holy Spirit inside us gives us the strength to keep going. It's a great scripture. It says this, Jesus said to her, in the Lazarus story, he says this, I am the resurrection and the life. Who else can say that? He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Jesus said. He's not away to the resurrection. He doesn't feel like the resurrection. 
He is the resurrection. The Bible says the word resurrection is stand up under. I stand up under. So you have the stand up under in you. Not only will you be resurrected one day, you can be assured of that, but you have the stand up under in you. Tim Keller says this again. He takes away the, God takes away the fear that we will not be enough. The resurrection doesn't promise that all circumstances of life go smoothly, but it does give us hope that we can be turned into the kind of people who can handle whatever comes. Mark on Friday night talked about Tony Campolo. He says this, we are Easter people. He said this, we are Easter people living in a Good Friday world. I want to finish with this. On Thursday night, Jesus was alone in the garden, but Sunday was coming. On Thursday night, Judas betrayed him with a kiss, but Sunday was coming. On Friday, he was brought before the Sanhedrin and falsely accused, but Sunday was coming. On Friday, Peter the disciple disowned him, but Sunday was coming. On Friday, soldiers mocked Jesus, put a crown of thorns and spat on him, but Sunday was coming. On Friday, he was beaten 40 times, but Sunday was coming. On Friday, nails were driven into his hands. And feet, he was hoisted on a cross, but Sunday was coming. On Friday on the cross, those around him cursed, laughed and mocked, but Sunday was coming. I know stuff has happened to you. Not little stuff, big stuff. I know there's been loss and disappointment and crisis and sickness, but let me tell you, Sunday is coming. Don't quit before Sunday. The enemy always puts the most pressure on just before Sunday, just before the resurrection because he wants you to quit. Don't quit before Sunday. Every Friday that you face, you will never face alone because he is risen. You have the resurrected Christ in you, the stand up under, the one who sustains and walks with you. You will make it. You won't just make it. I'm not going to just make it. I'm going to gloriously make it. Gloriously, Jenny. There's a beautiful scripture in Revelation 3.20. It says this, Here I am, Jesus speaking. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and I will dine with him and he with me. I'm going to get you to close your eyes in a minute because I want to give anyone an opportunity to invite Christ into their life. It's not complicated. But he is the only answer and the only hope because who else would stand in a courtroom for you and give their life? Not family, not marriage, not career, not your dog. Just close your eyes. And if you want to pray this prayer, a beautiful, simple prayer of inviting Christ into your life, pray it in your heart after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you for Easter Sunday and I thank you that I have found myself here. And right now, I admit I'm a sinner. I don't know what I am, four out of ten, six out of ten. But I need you, Jesus, because I want to be made righteous. And I want the check to be signed, paid in full. And I want to be declared forgiven and given eternal life. So, Lord Jesus, I ask you to come and live inside me. Come and live within me, Lord Jesus, and be my friend, my stand up under all the days of my life. If your eyes, While your eyes are closed, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, I just want you to look up and look at me. Anyone here for the first time, you say, Ros, I prayed that prayer so I can see you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, if you pray that prayer for the first time, I'd love to meet you after the service or just grab a Bible on the way out. Hey, church. How good is Jesus Christ?
Well, thank you so much, Roz, for that message. I don't know about you, church, but I've been so encouraged by that message of hope this morning. Haven't we, Ivan? Oh, it's been fantastic. Yeah, thanks, yeah. Roz. It was a great message. So why don't we just take a moment now and I'll encourage you around our giving. I love in John 10 verse 28 where Jesus says, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. What a gift, church. And all our Saviour asks of us is that we give him our heart. Because I know once, we, once he has our heart, then he can begin to teach us to be good givers. Givers from the heart, mm. givers of our time, givers of our gifts, givers of our finance, givers in all areas of life. So because we are a blessed people, let's give our Lord our heart this Easter. And what a great offering word for us, church. And okay, what a great service we've had today. And just a reminder that you, Craig Davidson, will be preaching for us next week. So look forward to that. And I just, we just pray that you have a wonderful day today, again on Easter Sunday. Thanks for tuning in. Happy Easter, church.